You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that app. I don't think anybody said Alicia Keys on the Twitters, but it dawned on me yesterday um, that she needs to be on the list, which I'm realizing probably isn't even best of all time anymore because it's it's just we're just listing singers at this point and singers that I like and appreciate, so... Let's just change best singers of all time to Ryan's favorite singers who are quite good at what they do. But if I wasn't allowed to put Ella Fitzgerald, or if you were to just say, um, as far as talent, style, and my own personal enjoyment, probably would put Alicia Keys at the top of my favorite female singers. By the way, this song, as well as two other songs, I don't, I don't want to say they define like junior, senior year of high school, because that's not necessarily what I listen to outside of, um, you know, before school with a big giant bowl of cereal listening to music videos. But, see, the thing about music videos that most of you probably know, they played the same songs over and over and over and over and over, and it got to be nauseating, but there was a period for me, junior, senior year, where there were three songs that I really liked, and they got played on a loop and I was happy about that. And every morning I wake up and be like, "Come on, play that play that one. Play play one of those good ones." This was one of them. And I'm just wondering if anybody remembers that exact period. Watch whether you hated these songs or loved these songs. They played these 3 and and a couple others that came in and out, but these 3 over and over again. You ready for number 2? And and by the way, I ju- it just hit me what it was. To- I've been trying to think cuz I knew there was a trio and I knew the second song. I'm like, what was that other freaking song? I had no idea what it sounded like. I just knew there was a big giant champagne glass in it. And that's all I knew. And I googled giant champagne glass and boom, first one that popped up. I'm like, yeah, that's that's the one. I'm not going to play a lot, but if you know it, you know it. Here it is. And then the third song in the trio is thusly. I'm sorry, Miss Jackson. And then I would get my disc man and walk to school with uh, Metallica bumping in my uh, headphones or something. But that's it. That's that's uh, that's high school. Anyways, thank you all for joining. I do have to let you all know, and I'm going to save it for the end because usually when I am, uh, let's say, in a bad mood or rant or whatever, I, I just drop it right in the beginning and then it kind of ruins the whole thing because I don't want to talk about anything else because I'm in a bad mood. So I'm just going to warn you right now, if you're not into it, if you don't like the ranting, you don't like the raving, um, I don't know how it's going to go because it's I have no idea. I just have something to say, and I know that generally when I talk about it, I get very upset. I'm going to save that for after the break. If you're not into it, if you don't like Angry Pack Daddy, after the break, just take the day, or I guess pro- probably before. I mean, if you want to patronize the, the advertisers, that's always appreciated. But just take the day off, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. If you're into it, then I'll see you there, okay? So you've been forewarned. So I don't want to hear any crying and complaining about you're so angry and burr, 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 burr. Don't listen, okay? You've been warned. You got your little trigger warning. Don't show up to the party, okay? By the way, for all you uh, stick to sports folks, there's going to be a little bleed over. So again, don't show up. But anyways, let's take care of this side of the break first. Got a couple of random things to uh, to go through today. Tomorrow, I'm kind of hoping that, um, well, let's start with this, actually. I'm hoping that there's lots to talk about tomorrow based on what we hear from Aaron Rodgers, but I don't really think that that's going to be the case. Talked about it a little bit before, but, you know, Aaron Rodgers' personality is, is very unique. I think he's got a lot of negative attributes, but one of the 
I guess, positive attributes about Aaron Rodgers is he's very supportive of other people. Right? I've, I've talked before about how he's sort of like the whole us against them mentality, right? The players versus the teams versus the league, whatever. So he's very supportive of his own players and stuff. Kenny Main, never heard of the guy in my life, but apparently he has a show on uh, ESPN. Um, this is his, his goodbye show. I'm guessing he said, look, man, um, I'd like to go out with a bang. Is there any way that you could help send me off just by showing up to my show? And I think Roger's personality was to say yes. And there probably was some kind of a prior relationship. They got, a, they got along fine. It's just a, a very nice, polite thing for Aaron Rodgers to do. With that said, I tend to think that that's what this is. I think Rodgers is just doing him a solid and is choosing to, I don't even want to say necessarily break his silence because I don't know what they're going to be talking about, but it just kind of hints to me that it's going to be kind of a nothing thing. Rodgers knows that this is massively huge and it, and it really just shows massive respect from Aaron Rodgers to him as sort of a farewell gift. I'm going to give you this. Now, some people could probably come and say, well, wouldn't it be the biggest farewell gift and, and the biggest bang to say that we came to an agreement or whatever, or to, to really speak his, I guess. But again, I, I think that he's been quiet for a reason. I think that the sides are what they are for a reason. In other words, he's quiet because he's being told he needs to. It's all part of how this negotiation is going to work. And assuming that a deal isn't done, that's still his job is to remain quiet. And so I think he has very strict instructions as far as what he can and cannot say on this show. Again, I think those tend to include, um, number one is going to be ripping the media apart for saying they don't know what they're talking about, which again, doesn't necessarily mean anything. I could have a bunch of people be like, he's like, uh, he's a solid 30 pounds overweight right now, that, that Packernet guy. And I could be like, you know what? You guys don't know what you're talking about. This is a podcast. You don't know. You're not my doctor. You guys just make stuff up because you like clicks and all that stuff. It's all true, by the way, everything you said. But I can still trash you and call you stupid and hope that people that really like me are like, ha, ah, he got you. And in reality, it's like, yeah, they, they kind of got me. But I'm just going to still call them stupid and hope they feel bad about themselves. Again, my hope is that there's lots of really juicy details. And if nothing else, just give me something where I can pretend to read between the lines, as I talked about before. If he specifically says, I want to come back as a Green Bay Packer, I don't think he's going to lie about that. It doesn't mean there aren't serious problems. It doesn't mean he may not come back. But I think that's somewhat telling. If he avoids saying that, I think that's sort of telling just dawned on me too i don't know how i'm gonna get i'm gonna have it's at 10 o'clock and i don't even have espn so i'm gonna have to have somebody relay to me what he said this is gonna be horrible i like to be done recording by like 10 o'clock i guess i can go back to the old three o'clock schedule but then it's like i have to get up at three and real quick listen to try to find a video of everything he said maybe that's what i'll do and i'm just gonna count on one of you guys to send me a something find find it somewhere youtube i don't know anywhere but you know, it, I'm obviously bringing it up numerous times for a reason. There is a possibility that something big is about to happen. And this, and listen, this is big news. I've had other people say, I'm tired of hearing about it. Dude, you're going to hear about it. As much as I don't like the clickbait, not, oh, I shouldn't say that. I, I, I do appreciate when it's my clickbait. But as much as I don't like just fake making stuff up when there's really nothing there type content, this is the biggest story in the NFL. This is one of the biggest stories for the Green Bay Packers franchise and us Packers fans in... Um, a, a very, 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 very long time. So it's going to be talked about. I do understand, understand the frustration for people who are like 99.999% sure Aaron Rodgers is going to be the quarterback and they're just trying to work out a couple of little details and stuff. All right, fine. That's where you're at. But we don't have confirmation of that. And the majority of the fan base is not quite where you're at. So just let us, all right? Um, I got a question from Josh on Twitter. He says, how much weight would Alan Lazard have to gain to transform into one of the elite tight ends in the league? Um, there's a lot of different ways I can approach this question. The number one thing is there isn't a weight to make you an elite tight end. <laughs> I know you know that, but the way you phrase that, I, I have to at least say that. Elite tight end isn't necessarily a weight. Um, to be completely honest, I think in terms of function, he already is. Really, again, we... we when you look at what a tight end is asked to do, he's already a better blocker than a lot of tight ends in the NFL, regardless of weight. I feel like Alan Lazard right now is a tight end that plays mostly out wide. 
Now, would his production as a blocker go down if you put him more in line? Maybe. I don't know. I can't see his grades and stats and everything else when he's closer to the line of scrimmage going up against, you know, edge rushers and linebackers as opposed to wide receivers. But again, in terms of function, he might be right where he needs to be. Also have to understand, as you pack on more weight, you see probably a decline in his ability to be a wide receiver. And I I tend to think that, I mean, even if today we called him a tight end, he's not an elite wide receiver. If we lower his production as, or excuse me, his, as of today, he is not a, an elite tight end. If you lower his receiving ability, I think he becomes less of an elite tight end. Um... So I, I, I don't think that that's going to happen. Now, if you wanted to just say we don't want you at wide receiver, let's say because we've got a bunch of other guys that we like. Funchess is killing it. Amari's killing it. We want you on the field, but, you know, what are we – and we want to put you in line. Right now, the smallest tight end, and I'm sure there's others, but if you look at the top 10 or 20 tight ends, the lightest you're going to find is 245. Generally, you're up in like the 250 range, 255. But I would say at a, at a bare minimum, he's got to put on 20 to 25 pounds if you want to legitimately call him a tight end and keep him there more often. But I don't think they need to. I think he's a really good weapon the way that he is, whatever he is. I don't think we need to necessarily put him in a box of you need to gain 20 pounds because we want you to be a tight end. Because I, I just, I don't want to mess with it. You know what I mean? It's like when my, my, my two youngest daughters, my second youngest is four, my youngest is something months. I don't know, eight months, something like that. I can't keep track of the month. I don't know. I barely can remember my kids, how many years they are. Time just goes, she's like, I don't know, what is she, two or three? So she's four. It's like, what? Since when is she four? She's talking, right? I guess, yeah. But she's very, my, the four-year-old is very smothering. She's very like, gotta be in your face, gotta, and she's not very gentle. So, you know, babies are generally not very content very long. So when she's very content and just hanging out on the floor, kind of learning how to crawl, which she's getting there, she mostly just goes in reverse, pushes herself back, whatever. It's like, just let her be happy. But here comes the four-year-old. Ooh, there she is. She's happy. I want her to pay attention to me and love me and play with me. So I'm going to go over and give her a giant squeezing hug and I'm going to roll her over on her back and try to tickle her stomach. And then the baby starts crying. You know, just, and I, I, I say this to her every five seconds, just leave her alone. If she's happy, leave her alone. To be fair, the part that I leave out is if she's upset, I still want you to leave her alone. Just leave her alone all the time unless I say it's okay. I don't know. I don't actually know what the rule is. I just know that I get annoyed when she's finally happy and you come along and make her upset. With Alan Lazard, everything's okay, right? I don't know. Maybe you can make it a little bit better here and there. I just It's working. My opinion, let's just leave it alone. I don't know if I pack 20 pounds on him that he's going to be able to do much. 20 pounds is a lot of weight. Maybe he can block a little bit better, but I, I feel like we're kind of getting into Mercedes Lewis territory. Might as well just pack 30 on him and see what he can do as a blocker. Because I, I don't know if we're getting much of a receiver anymore. Just my thought. I don't know. By the way, this is all completely random. So th- there's no real segues. I'm just jumping all over the place from question to question, comment to comment. I find them all interesting, but it's like, wait, why are we talking about Alan Lazard? Now we're going to talk about Jamal, ready? Okay? Transition. Whoosh. So I saw a uh, article, comment thing, whatever. I could have swore I linked it in here, but I guess I didn't. I don't really care. It doesn't matter. It's out there. You can find it if you want to find it. But there was, it might have been PFT, actually. I don't know. Who cares? But it, it, it said something to the effect of Jamal Williams is set to become the number one back in Detroit. Now, don't get me wrong. We all love Jamal, and for good reason. Not just because he's a fun guy, happy guy, cool guy. He's a great running back. Oh, great might be a stretch. Let's be honest. He's a very good running back. When you factor in especially blocking and receiving ability and, and how well-rounded he is as a pure runner, probably a little bit closer to average, but you factor all that in, he's a, he's a great weapon to have as a, as a running back. But the one thing that I find interesting, and, and again, I, I, I hammer this probably too much, but whatever, whatever, you know, what else are we going to do all day long? For all the people complaining about you know, the Packers being a poverty franchise, which really is not something that Packers fans say, but it's, it's what they mean when they complain 24-7. Bears fans call us a poverty franchise, and I have to assume being ironic. To, to be completely honest, I, I sometimes wonder if Bears, Lions, and Vikings fans have more respect and reverence for the Packers than, than about a quarter of the fan base does, because they understand what it's like to actually struggle in life, which I actually just learned some scientific research on that, which is interesting, but you don't care, so we'll leave it alone. But the bottom, the, the, the point of the research is 
When things get easier, we don't just say, oh, wow, great, my life is getting easier. We just find new crap to complain about. And so that's why, especially in the country we live in, um, minor things become major things that we have to march in the street about. And, and normal, rational people sit back and go, what are you talking about, dude? Anyways, it, it's a real scientific thing that's been studied, and it's, it's real, and it's pathetic, and it's why we suck. But anyways, first world problems is, is a good way to summarize that. But Packer fans are the first world problem fan base of, of the NFL. And this is a great example of that. We don't even think about running back. When we were successful and didn't have running backs, we still didn't care about running backs. And maybe a little bit, right? But we never put any effort in. You know how long the Lions have been trying to get running backs? Who was that? Since Barry Sanders. Since Barry Sanders. There was a guy, I'm never going to remember his name, but there was like a a glimmer where it was like, oh man, maybe they got their guy. And then I think he got hurt and he wasn't that good anyway. But they just keep trying and trying and trying and they can't do it. The Packers take a legitimate swing once on a guy by the name of Eddie Lacy, and it's a great, great hit. Then several years later, Eddie Lacy's gone. They're like, well, we better put some more effort into it, uh, but we don't want to go early, so we're going to take a bunch of swings at it. They take three running backs. Two of them are fantastic running backs. Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams. Aaron Jones is one of the best backs in football. Jamal Williams is a starter on a lot of other teams in the NFL. On this team, he would be number three. The Lions have taken second-round pick running backs, what, two out of the last three years? Out of the last four years? What has it been? Let's take a look. Yeah, the last four. I wasn't counting this past year, obviously. So 2018, they took Carrion Johnson, and everybody freaked out, right? Oh, man, they got Carrion. Look out. Here they come. Here come the Lions, finally. And it's kind of, it's a little scary, right? And to be fair, in 2015, they took Amir Abdullah in the second round, too. And they had Theo Riddick back in 2013. He was a later round guy, but so was uh, whatever. Theo Riddick didn't pan out. Amir Abdullah. I liked Amir Abdullah. That was the same year we got Eddie Lacy. I liked um, Duke Johnson and Amir Abdullah as like those kind of third down backy guys. I never really liked him as starters, but I thought with Eddie Lacy slash Amir Abdullah, that'd be kind of cool. Maybe that wasn't the same year. Maybe that was after. And I thought, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Amir Abdullah obviously didn't pan out as an every down back because that's what he's never really built to be. Again, they try again um, in 2018 with Carrion Johnson. And just like everything else, you get a little scared. Like, dude, they might actually have a running back. They, it's second round, that's pretty serious. Not good. Two years later, DeAndre Swift, right? Seems like maybe he might be okay. He's considered maybe the best or one of the best running backs in that class. Super scary. Lions got him. Like, oh, man, I think they got it this time. And after one year, it's like, I don't know, he wasn't that good. But maybe, you know, give him some time. He seemed decent. The Lions poach our number three running back. Not really poach, but we let him go and they scooped him up. And there's already headlines saying he might be the number one. Now, maybe he won't be. I don't know. But keep in mind, despite the the fact that DeAndre Swift is probably a more talented athlete than probably any of the, well, maybe not uh, A.J. Dillon, but as far as what you can do physically, whatever. Jamal is a veteran that can do it, right? DeAndre Swift was a good receiving back in college, blah, blah, blah. Um, Jamal has been able to prove that in the NFL for many years. He is a very hard physical runner. So he can do first down, second down, third down, because he can block, he can catch, he can run, and he can run hard. So you can put him in there on fourth and two. So you can kind of see where he might end up being. But do, do you see the stark contrast? Again, we complain and we complain and we complain about the Packers. They don't ever do enough. They don't, da, 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 da. They don't know how to dread. They can't, you overhype them. You're just, dude, this is, this is the difference between a team that is really good at what they do and a team that really just has not been. And also keep in mind, this is a new regime new regime in Detroit, and this may be a new leaf. In other words, Penny Sewell, Levi Onwuzurike, Alim McNeil, Efedi Melfonwu, Amon Ross St. Brown, Derek Barnes, uh, Jamar Jefferson. That is a, by the way, almost every single name in that is a, is a guy that I really like. Penny Sewell, obviously. Levi Onwuzurike, I mentioned, is one of the few defensive tackles that can go uh, both ways as a run defender and pass rusher. Alim McNeil, great nose tackle. Um, Amon Ra in the fourth. Jamar Jefferson in the seventh round, I think, is a really ta- He's a smaller school guy out of Oregon State, but really talented. Run- the whole thing. So maybe it's a new day. Maybe they're going to be doing better. And, and remember, DeAndre Swift was not this regime's draft pick, so they don't really care. If, if, uh, if Jamal is a better running back, he's going to play because they couldn't care any less if DeAndre Swift is a bust because they didn't pick him. I mean, they don't want him to be because he's on this team, but it's no skin off their back. But just think about and, and it's not just running back that you can do that with. 
our number three running back is is potentially the Lions' number one. Look at the offensive line. Obviously, quarterback, wide receiver, despite all the complaining about wide receiver. There's so many positions all over the place that there is just, just wealth of talent. So take solace in it. Again, as I've said a thousand times, there is no perfect team. There's never going to be a perfect team. But take solace in the fact that the Packers are a legitimate organization that do things the right way and as a result will always have a shot, which is all you're ever going to get. Never going to be a guarantee. You're only ever going to get a shot. And so far, Brian Gutekunst and Matt, well, I shouldn't even say Matt, Brian Gutekunst has put this team in an opportunity to win a Super Bowl every year that he's been the GM. And unless and until he starts to slip, that's going to be every year. Um, Probably could have let off with this, but I'm doing things at a crazy order. Um, the Packers apparently are still bringing in quarterbacks. Transition, whoosh. Now, look, again, we can go round and round about whether this means something or doesn't. Does it mean Aaron Rodgers is out the door? No. But it doesn't make sense, as I've said a thousand times now. But now we add a new layer. I said Blake Bortles doesn't make sense if you have an MVP quarterback and a number one, uh, a, a first round pick that's ready to go. My point was. Either they're worried about Aaron Rodgers leaving, or Jordan Love isn't ready to take over, or a little bit of both. Or maybe they're, you know, they don't know either way. They don't know if Jordan Love is ready. They don't know if Aaron Rodgers is coming back, so we got to do something. Now Blake Bortles is on the team. So we have three first-round picks, and we signed Kurt Benkert. So we have four. So I'm not sure exactly what the role is for all these guys. They're going to come in. They're going to compete. They're, we're going to see what happens. Fine. But we got a stacked room now. We have... MVP Aaron Rodgers. We have first round pick Jordan Love. We have uh, veteran, former starting quarterback, first round pick Blake Bortles. And we have uh, basically, quote unquote, number three camp arm Kurt Benkert. Benkert, however, I don't know. So we're set, right? Nope. We're bringing in more quarterbacks. Donald Hammond III has come in for a workout. You know, sometimes the Packers do this. They'll, They'll really emphasize a position. But the, the difference between that and this is when they do that, we always look at it and go, wow, they really must want to improve this position, right? We, we acknowledge it for what it is. If, if they're bringing in a ton of defensive tackles, one after the other, we're thinking they're really worried about defensive tackle. They're trying to bolster that group. When they do it for quarterback, suddenly it becomes contentious. It doesn't mean anything. This is, fi- this is nothing. They're really hammering this position. Again, maybe it's about love and not uh, Aaron Rodgers, but it's about something. Because again, this is this was already abnormal behavior with Blake Bortles. Now Blake Bortles is officially signed, and Kurt Benkert is officially signed, and we're still looking at more quarterbacks. Well, they already told us. Why is this a big deal? They told us they're going to bring a bunch of guys in. So what? It's kind of a random thing, but this is how I do analogies. Just don't call the FBI, okay? It's just the first analogy that popped into my head. If I told you on this podcast that I'm going to start amassing arms, right? Just weaponry. I'll say ridiculous ones so that people chill out, but tanks, right? Moabs. I'm just going to start piling them up. And I'm telling you that right now. And then I start doing it. And some people are like, Hey dude, um, this is really weird behavior and I don't think it's safe. And I think we should alert the, the authority. Would it make any sense for you to pop up and be like, dude, he told us he was going to do that. So what? Call the police, call the FBI. Dude, you're being an idiot. He told us he was going to, what does that have to do with the fact that you're amassing arms and this is really scary and dangerous and we should probably call the authority. It has nothing to do with that. Just because he said he was going to do it doesn't make it like it's not a big deal. It has nothing to do with anything. But they, they told us they were going to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And maybe we didn't fully understand what they meant by that until they started doing it. And it was like, oh, oh, that's what you meant. Holy cow. All right. All right. Thought you meant like you were going to add a shotgun to your collection. I didn't realize you were going to bring a panzer tank in here. But anyways, Donald Hammond, um, somewhat of an interesting prospect. He played for Air Force, so obviously not a massive program. He also only played in 2018 and 19, did not play in 2020. But um, there does seem to be something here, at least as far as you can tell from a small school uh, prospect, six foot two, 210. 2018 overall grade was a 74, and then he kind of broke out in 2019 with a 90, basically, overall grade, 89.3. Um, also kind of exciting aspect, 82 overall passing grade, but a 79.6, basically an 80 rushing grade, which is pretty uncommon, even among, um, running quarterbacks that sometimes they don't grade out super well. Like, I don't think Justin Fields has a very high rushing grade. 
But um, as a passer, um, completion percentage was actually quite low. Let's see what his adjusted completion percentage was, if I can even find it. I don't know, but it was 49.6 completion percentage, 1,300 yards, 13 touchdowns, 6 interceptions. Big time throw percentage was almost 11%, which is ridiculous. Um, again, another sort of, I'm, I'm just going to call everybody that fits this mold a, a Brett Favre, but 4% turnover-worthy play, which is relatively high. I don't even know why he, statistically, I don't know how he graded out quite so high. Not really sure, because 1,300 yards isn't very much. 49.6 completion percentage is extremely low, and six interceptions compared to 13 touchdowns is um, not the greatest ratio. But, um, again, with the completion percentage, it also has to do with wide receivers, and 12.5% of his passes were dropped. Oh, 61% adjusted completion percentage. They moved everything around. I'm struggling to find it. But 108.1 passer rating, um, about 65% of this guy's passes came um, 10 or more yards. Nearly a third of his passes, 30.1%, were beyond 20 yards. So, um, yeah, he, he's a he's a big-time thrower. As far as grades, short passes, he had a 60 overall grade, which I don't know how you get a 60 on short passes, but he did. One touchdown, three interceptions, okay. Uh, medium, which is 10 to 19 yards, 81 overall, and then deep passes, 90 overall grade. So that's where he lives, man. He, he just lives to air it out. As far as pressure, about a 56 under pressure, 92.5 when he's clean, which is normal aside from having a really, really high um, grade with no pressure. Uh, let's see, 50.8 completion percentage, 923 yards, 10 touchdowns, one interception when kept clean, 18.8 Big time throw percentage when he's kept clean. This this guy wants nothing but the deep ball, man. He's got to take several years just to learn to calm down. That's that's the only thing we got to teach Donald Hammond here in Green Bay. You need to relax. Jeez. Um, and then as a runner, he's got on the season. This is 2019. Um, 128 attempts for 557 yards, 13 touchdowns, and nine fumbles, which is way too much fumbling. Almost all of those, by the way, were designed runs. Apparently, there were only three sc scrambles in there for 18 yards, which is crazy. Only three times did the pocket break down and he decided to run. Um, the rest of it, 539 yards were all on designed runs. But uh, seven missed tackles forced, 42 yards was his longest, 13 uh, rushes of 10 or more yards, five for over 15 yards, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so... Don't expect a ton from Mr. Donald Hammond, but it's uh, it's a fun toy for the Packers to play with because he's obviously got some talent. There's just probably quite a bit of work to uh, to do with him. I wonder too if a uh, what I'm calling a number three or a, a scout team quarterback has different criteria than what you get in, in for example a number one or number two. In other words, maybe you're looking for a certain style, but remember if your job is to run scout team, I wonder if you just look for something else. In other words, I don't really expect you to play for us. I mean, it's possible if you're going to be the number three, you, if there's enough injuries, you're going to end up playing. But I think any team that loses two quarterbacks knows that their season is done. I wonder if it's just a matter of we need you to be able to do what other teams. So in other words, first of all, you have to be kind of fast because we're going to need you to be able to simulate a mobile quarterback if and when we go up against one. You need to be able to have a big arm just, you know, because sometimes we're going to need you to make those kinds of throws. So in other words, you don't have to be very good. You just got to be able to check all these little boxes here. I don't know. I never really thought about it before. Anyways, I do have one more question. Um, I don't know if I'm going to save it for tomorrow and just launch into this thing or if I should just answer it after the break. I'll probably just save it. Also, uh, Jacob, who helps with uh, a lot of the stuff that I do here at the Packernet podcast, he wanted me to remind all of you he's got a bunch of signed merchandise. So there's all kinds of giveaways all the time, and it's all kind of a mess because I'm not very good at remembering to tell you guys stuff. But he's looking for some feedback. We're all looking for some feedback as far as what kind of fun contests we could do to give away some uh, some merch. So what kind of incentives would be fun? Uh, just just shoot me some ideas. We'll have a little bit of fun. Also, uh, don't forget, if we get to 300 patrons, um, your options, if, if you are the winner, in other words, I'll pick one person who is a patron. If we get to 300 by the end of week one, your options are a free PFF subscription, a Game Pass subscription, the newest Madden that's coming out, whatever that may be, or Packers tickets. And by tickets, I mean one ticket. <laughs> you can keep it, use it, you can sell it, you can give it to a buddy. I don't really care. But um, just a reminder that that is also still out there for you. You can jump in and support the podcast for as little as $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. Please check that out. We'll take a break and we'll be right back.
Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. I'm really curious how many people, as soon as I said, you know, trigger warning, be careful after the break is going to be, how many people just said, forget this, I'm just skipping to after the break. (laughs) Welcome to all of you who missed the entire first segment. So you you can probably guess, um, but... There was an ESPN article that came out. Eugene Chung says he was called, quote, not the right minority during an NFL coaching interview. Former NFL offensive lineman and assistant coach Eugene Chung, who is Korean, says he was told that he was, quote, not the right minority, unquote, while interviewing for an NFL coaching job this offseason. It makes my skin crawl just reading this. Continuing on, quote, it was said to me, Well, you're really not a minority, Chung said during a webinar Thursday, according to the Boston Globe, adding, quote, I was like, wait a minute, last time I checked, when I look in the mirror and brush my teeth, I was a minority. According to Chung, after he asked the interviewer to explain, he was told he was, quote, not the right minority we're looking for. Chung did not identify the team in question, but said he was stunned to hear such a comment. Quote, I asked about it, and as soon as the backtracking started, I was like, oh, no, 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 you said it. Now that it's out there, let's talk about it, Chung said according to The Globe. Quote, it was absolutely mind-blowing to me that in 2021, something like that is actually a narrative. Here's the thing. Why would that be shocking that that would be a narrative in 2021? That's exactly what we're pushing in 2021. This is exactly what we want in 2021. The entire notion of anti-racism is entirely pushing massive amounts of racism. The NFL is becoming a massively racist organization with, with massive race based race based policies in fact we hear nothing we, we we can't go a day without hearing about institutional racism let me read you the definition of what institutional racism is institutional racism also known as systemic racism is a form of racism that is embedded through laws and regulations within society or an organization so it is specifically when there is a law that is that is giving either preference or discriminating against a group based on their race, which is despicable. It's racism. Or an organization, i.e. the NFL. Every race-based policy they have is literally institutional racism. And hilariously, the exact people who are always screaming about institutional racism are the ones that want these policies. This is disgusting. And we're just going to keep getting more and more of it. So I don't know what he's talking about. He's shocked in 2021. Uh, It would have been shocking maybe in uh, 1995. It's not shocking in 2021. This is what we do now. The other thing that annoys me about this article and this Chung guy is he almost seems annoyed that he's not on the other side of the fence. How about we get annoyed that there's a fence? Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm I'm not on this team. I'm on that team. I should be over there. No, no, no. Let's get rid of the freaking fence. Let's not worry about what team we're on or what side we're on. Everybody's trying to rush to that side of the fence. Let's get rid of the fence. It's disgusting, and nobody cares. Nobody cares. Because the fact of the matter is, discrimination is not only tolerated, it's celebrated in America in 2021. So long as you discriminate against the right people. And now this is becoming a gray area. 
Because on one side, which again, this whole conversation is disgusting that we even have to talk about this because moral people everywhere do not discriminate based on race, despite the fact that that is becoming common in America today. But on one side, we have confusion among people that like to uh, put up these fences, let's say, because there's this whole movement of stop Asian hate. On the other hand, Asians have been pushed and pushed and pushed on the other side of the fence for a very long time. And so this is the only reason this is even in an article right now, because there's some confusion. Some people don't want this article to be written. Let's not talk about it. Other people who are more in the stop Asian hate, which, by the way, great thing. Yeah, we should. Stop all hate would be great. But they want to pump this out there. It's just, it's just I don't know. I, I, listen, I don't have any hope anymore. I just don't. I have no hope for this country. I have no hope for the NFL. I have no hope whatsoever. I mean, people have just become disgusting in my eyes, to be completely honest. But on an individual basis, on a person-to-person basis, if you want to be hateful and angry, you will be given permission by our society to do so. I'm just asking you not to. You can go on Twitter right now, and as long as you pick from the right group, you can go on and say this entire group is trash, and you'll be celebrated for it. You'll be a bigot, but you'll be celebrated. So it's up to you. You can choose to be on the side of morality which is not, does not group people into giant categories and say, you're all evil. You're all the bad guys. You're all the oppressors. And there's all kinds of rules in place. There's some stupid rule about power, apparently. Listen, if you actually care about human beings, you're not going to play word games. There's a very simple rule. You don't judge people based on the way they look. You don't judge them because of their gender. You don't judge them because of their skin color. You don't even judge them because of how much money they have. That makes you garbage. If you want to play a semantical game, it's fine. You don't even have to explain yourself. Nobody cares anymore. Just go ahead and be hateful and you'll, you'll be celebrated. It's fine. You can start entire companies like the NFL and discriminate based on race. And you'll be mostly celebrated until you kind of cross a little gray area here. And then you start seeing articles and little flare-ups of, hey, that's not very nice. But generally speaking, you can do it. It's funny because it's not really funny. You, you hear all these people all the time saying, if I was there, I would have stood up against that the most horrible places in the world, the crazy thing is they always had permission for being angry. That's what a lot of these societies were, whether it's communist China or or Nazi Germany. The scientists, the culture, the government, all they did was give you permission to be hateful and angry. That's all they did. You have my permission to exercise your anger toward certain groups. Very good and decent people didn't do that because they're good and decent people. Angry, hateful, bitter people took advantage of it. Don't be an angry, hateful, garbage person. This is your opportunity to stand up, look at stuff like this, and say, this is trash. We don't tolerate this kind of behavior. I don't, I don't act that way. I don't raise my kids to be that way. I don't tolerate that kind of behavior. I don't care what color you are, what gender you are, any of that. You will not treat people like this. That's what a good person does. I'm disgusted by this. <laughs> And to have a team just blatantly say, no, you're not the right minority. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? What does that have to do with anything? What does the color of this guy's face have to do with hiring somebody for a coaching job? And, and, you know, and I sit here and I talk about how, you know, these guys are smart and they know what they're doing and they're real intelligent and they they get the best of the best. No, they don't. Apparently they're hiring you based on uh, what your eyes look like. Sorry, your eyes aren't the right shape. Your skin isn't dark enough. I guess this is this is just it's it's hard to to take anything seriously anymore. This is a joke. It's pathetic, and it's just you know I'm I'm just to the point where you just sit back and just watch it and just shrug and just say, well, I guess we're just going to watch this thing burn. This is disgusting, and and regardless of, of of the team, this is what the NFL has set up. And by the way, this is what our culture demands. The NFL only sets it up because it's what our culture demands now. This is what we want from the NFL. So the NFL says, hey, we got to give the people what they want. So they institutionalize racism in their own company. And now teams looking to do what they think is best for their team, take advantage of the perks for being racist. And so now we just have abject racism in the hiring process. Apparently we're now so comfortable with it. We just tell them to their face, sorry, you're not the right race. That's how far down the rabbit hole we've gone. I mean, this is, this is, this is just evil stuff. This is disgusting. And and again, I, I, I don't, I, I can't even really get mad about it because it's it's so permeated. There's there's uh, nobody cares anymore. But it is what it is. I mean, you you got to make your again. You got to make your own individual decision. You're either going to be okay with this stuff and you're going to go along with it, and you're going to be if 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 your goal is to be popular, then go along with it. 
If you're an angry, bitter person wanting to exercise your anger and your bitterness, go along with it. You'll be given permission. If all you want is to be a moral and good person, you're going to struggle in this society. If all you want is to actually treat people equally, you're going to struggle in this society. You're going to read articles like this, you're going to get annoyed, and as soon as you speak out about it, people are going to lash out at you. How dare you? Because they don't want you tearing it down, because there are people who genuinely want a society in which they're allowed to exercise their anger and their hatred, and you're trying to stop that. And you think I'm lying. This happens everywhere. This is human history 101. We want to be able to hate each other. That's it. Why are you stopping this? I finally have permission to exercise my anger, my bitterness, my hatred. You don't think I'm telling the truth? Find somebody on Twitter that says all men are trash. 90% of the comments are going to be positive. And if anybody comes out and, and defends themselves as a man, they're going to get ripped to shreds. That's the culture we live in today. Oh, you're sensitive. Oh, you're... it's not about sensitive. It's about be a decent person. That's it. It's just, that's all I'm saying. I don't care. I'm asking you to be decent to other human beings. That's it. I would like it if the, the NFL that I dedicate myself to um, wasn't a racist organization, but apparently it is. I'm not talking about against Kaepernick. Again, institutional racism has to do with policies in place. There is an actual, po there are numerous policies in place against certain races. That is institutional racism definitionally. And again, if you want to play word games about what racism is, fine. Keep the word racism. Bigotry against somebody based on their race is a problem, whether you want to call it racism or not. I don't really care about the word. This isn't about words and, and how we can manipulate definitions so that I can get away with being a bigot. Sexism is discrimination based on somebody's sex. Ageism is discrimination of somebody based on their age. Classism is discrimination against somebody based on their class. Racism is discrimination against somebody based on their race. Power has nothing to do with how the, the morality of it. Don't treat people like trash because of the way they look. That is morality 101. And if you can't do that, you're not a good person. It's that simple. And I'm not going to give you a pass. Again, Twitter's going to give you a pass. Our culture's going to give you a pass. I'm not going to give you a pass. I'm going to call you a piece of crap, and you, you can go ahead and not listen to my show anymore. I don't care. I'm not okay with any of this. Good, decent people anywhere are not okay with this. Decent people don't like when people are mean to other groups of people, regardless of who it is. If you treat women like garbage, you're a piece of garbage. If you treat men like garbage, you're a piece of garbage. If you treat black people like garbage, you're a piece of garbage. If you treat white people like garbage, you're a piece of garbage. That is a very basic standard. And I wish we could just live by that standard, but apparently we can't. The NFL certainly doesn't seem to, be, to want to live by that standard. Again, I have no hope for our culture coming back because we're too far down the rabbit hole. Angry people are now being given permission to be angry whenever they want, and they're taking full advantage of it. They love it. We're now giving permission to be hateful. So all I'm saying is we need more people that are going to stand up and say, I'm not okay with it. Because if we don't, we just keep going down this pathway. And if we don't stop jumping in the comments of hateful people saying, yeah, you go, girl. You, you say all men are trash. Guess what? We're not making things better making things worse. Somebody has to step up and say, you know what? Don't say that. That's kind of a stupid comment, don't you think? We do this sometimes, but again, there's only certain approved groups that you're allowed to hate. We need, we need to just tear down that fence. You're not allowed to do this anymore. You're not allowed to hire people based on their race, which, all, by the way, is already against the law. But apparently, again, you can do whatever you want. Nobody actually cares. As long as you do it against certain groups, it doesn't matter. And apparently Asians are on uh, my side of the fence now. Sorry, bud. All that stop Asian hate stuff on Twitter, yeah, they don't actually believe it. <laughs> they don't care. They don't care about you because you're not the right skin color. Sorry. Isn't that, th 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 doesn't that make, are you uncomfortable? You're supposed to be because we shouldn't be talking about this because this whole thing is disgusting. But here we are, 2021 in America, this is what we do. And again, it's not going to get better. It's just going to keep getting worse. I'm not here trying to change the world. I'm just saying we've only got a couple years left on this earth. That's it. Don't spend what little time you have here being somebody that contributes to hatred. It's a personal thing. It's, it's just, it's, it's what you have to choose to do. No, I have the right to because other people are mean to me. Well, if that's how you want to live your life, fine. Some people have hardships and choose to be a good person. But if not you, that's fine. You got to live your life how you want to live your life. And the NFL is going to do what they want to do. And the, this country is going to go in a certain direction. And that's not going to change. All you can do is be an individual and say, as an individual, I refuse to stand up with that. As an individual, I, stand to to I, I won't tolerate that. I'm not going to play whataboutism. I'm not going to change definitions so that I get... Ex you don't need to, to play games. You, you have excuses. You do whatever you want. 
Nobody's going to stop you. Nobody can stop you. You're allowed to exercise hatred. I'm just saying, consider maybe not doing that. Consider working on yourself so that you're not hateful. Because obviously something's very wrong deep down inside if you're that angry. And it's a you problem, not a world problem. It's not society. It's not that group that you hate. It's you. You, you are a problem with yourself. Fix it. Because we're all getting very tired of living in this country with angry, bitter people just exercising their hate all day long. And again, the, the, the worst part about this entire article is the fact that it's just a blip. And, and the only reason it's even an article is because it's a gray area. But nobody cares. We're just going to move on. This, this is... This is it's, it's, it's disgusting. And again, <laughs> again the, the guy, is, he's not even looking at it saying this is racism and, I'm, and I'm, I'm appalled that they're being racist. He's upset because they don't see him as a minority. He's upset that he's on the other side of the fence. Wait a minute, I want to be on that side. It's just crazy to me how far things have fallen. But whatever. This is going to be every year. Every year we're going to hear about this kind of stuff, and every year I'm going to tell you that I think it's stupid, and I think it's wrong, and I think it's hurtful, and I think it's divisive because it is, and I think we need to start treating people as people, and that's it. And I don't think that's a very hard standard, and I don't think that that's a, uh, a terrible standard to live by. If you don't know them as individuals, get to know them as individuals and then judge them based on their character. I mean, this, this is a long-standing thing set in stone, by Martin Luther King, a guy that we pretend to like, but nobody agrees with him anymore. Why do you care what this Chung guy looks like? Why do we care? Why are you doing this? Why are we tolerating this? I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, it grieves me that my children have to grow up in this, especially not knowing how much worse this is going to get, how much more angry people are going to get. What happens when people continue to get more and more angry? What does history say happens when people get more and more angry and their anger doesn't get checked and can, instead it gets encouraged? You think there's an end to it? You think there's an end to anger? That's not how that works. We need to put it in check pretty quickly. This is disgusting. This is racism. This is horrific. And we can't allow this to happen. The NFL is instituting racism and that shouldn't be tolerated. And I shouldn't have to sit here and say those words out loud. But here we are, sitting here trying to talk about contracts and stuff and it's like geez the feeling of hopelessness is just it's just unbelievable just watching things go in this direction and and how fast it's going is just it's crazy but whatever if that's how we're, we want life to be if that's what we want this country to be if that's how you want to be then i guess that's what it is i don't know what to tell you again i'm not going to change anything i don't really care about changing anything i just just pleading with you as a person to not participate in that because I'm, I'm, I'm at my absolute wit's end. I, I can't, I'm just, I'm tired of it. Aren't you exhausted? Don't you feel exhausted with all the fighting and arguing all the time? All the hatred, all the, uh, all the dividing. You're in that group. I'm in this group. I mean, even in this article, what is he saying? Oh, I thought I was in that group, and now they're telling me I'm in this group. I guess I'm in this group. I don't know. Forget your stupid group. The whole problem with this is that they put you in a group and discriminated against you. You're, you're, you should be outraged that they put you in a group. And instead, he's mad about what group he's in. It's just, God. I don't know. I don't know, man. thought we were making some progress, but I guess we just tore it completely down. I don't know. Whatever. Anyways, I got nothing else to say on it. This is and always will be my position. If you don't like it, that's too bad. Heck, maybe you can just go to Twitter right now and unleash a bunch of hate and watch all the people come rally around you and cheer for you. Probably make you feel better. Anyways, that's it. You folks have yourselves a fantastic whatever day it is. Hopefully we get some interesting Aaron Rodgers news, and hopefully above all this we find a way to finally start coming together and treating each other like human beings and not just being garbage. That would be my number one wish, but secondarily, I hope you have a good day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>